So believe it or not, somehow the time has come for me to say good morning and Merry Christmas. Can you believe it's that time already? We are in the middle of it. It is happening whether we're ready or not. Um, the Christmas season is upon us, and that means that Christmas songs are now appropriate to play. If you play those before Thanksgiving, I say that you're wrong. After Thanksgiving, it is now completely appropriate to play Christmas music. You probably heard them on the radio or on your playlist. They're seeping into our culture more and more each day. You probably have your favorites, as do I, and you probably have your least favorites, which I think we can agree, the very worst Christmas song ever written is Christmas Shoes. And if you don't know what it is, Google it. It pains me to hear that song. Sarah if you're not in agreement, I would love to hear what you think is worse. <laughs> <laughs> is it really? I'm so sorry. I have to disagree with you on that one. That song is heartbreaking and not Christmas spirity at all. <laughs> so for these next several weeks leading up to Christmas, including Christmas Eve, <clears throat> we're looking past the Christmas songs that we hear on the radio. We're looking past the remakes of the originals that never should have probably been remade in the first place. We're looking even past those original Christmas songs and hymns that go back hundreds of years. We're looking past even that. We're looking deep into what we would call the original Christmas soundtrack to these songs in the Bible recorded in scripture surrounding the birth of Jesus. Now, some of those songs were probably sung originally, like the person that is saying these things probably sung those things, and we'll hear from that soon. Others of those may not have been sung in their original form, but were early adopted as songs called canticles in the early church and were sung for hundreds of years by some of the first early Christians to be able to memorize those things. And as we go through this original soundtrack, I think you'll see that it carries incredible significance for us, and it adds depth and color to our beautiful and wonderful, well-known story of Christmas. And this morning, we're going to get into one of those original Christmas soundtrack songs, and it's going to be the song of Zechariah. <clears throat> now, it's going to take a little bit for us to get to it, so be patient as we approach this song. But I think to fully understand it, to really get it well, we need to dig really deep into Bible history. As we often say here at Aspen Grove Church, we believe the Bible to be true in its context and in its style. So we want to read passages within their context and style, but also understand the fuller biblical context of where the story falls and what it means. And what we're going to do today... We're going to see the full depth of the story this morning by understanding some of the Old Testament first. And by putting all of this together, you'll see that the Christmas story that we're looking at today is not just a story on its own, but it also echoes the greater story of God and what he's been doing since the beginning. Something that we in the Christian life would sometimes call redemptive history. God's larger story in all of history. So we're going to be looking at this story in a couple of dimensions. First of all, we want to see it in its immediate context, understanding what it meant for the characters at the time and how they were feeling and what it meant in that story. But also we want to see that the concepts that come forth in this story are symbolic and representative of what God is doing in this greater story of redemptive history. So, as I said, to do that, we have to go way back, all the way back, to the final words of the Old Testament. So if you're looking in your Bibles today, the physical Bible, we're looking at the book of Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, the end of the Old Testament. This is what the Word of God says. God speaking through the prophet Malachi says this, <clears throat> Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And you may read that and think, what a strange way for God to end the amazing and bumpy and sometimes confusing era of what we would call the Old Testament. <clears throat> God ends this portion of redemptive history with a promise. The promise is that he will send a prophet. Elijah, the prophet himself, had already come and gone. And God has said again that he will send one like Elijah. 
Now, I look forward to next year at some point, probably in the summer or fall, we'll cover Elijah in detail. But right now, we just know Elijah had already happened, but God's promise stands that one like Elijah is coming. And this Elijah that is coming will come and turn the hearts of fathers to their children and vice versa. Now, the promise of this verse is very much like the rest of the Old Testament. We see this happen over and over again. God speaks, God makes a promise. And God does what he says he will do. And now he has made a promise that has left the people hanging for a good period of time. But what I want you to see as we begin to study the New Testament story of Zechariah, as we look at the Old Testament leading into it, we can see this very clearly as the first blank on your sheets this morning. We can see and know that God is working his eternal plan. This morning for our kids' kids, we included these little gingerbread houses that they can put together. This kind of works for what we're saying. It helps to know what it is you're building, right? If you just had pieces and had no idea what you were doing, if you didn't have a plan, you wouldn't know how to build that. But the plan helps to execute that plan, right? You need to know what you're doing so that you can do it well. And this morning as you build those gingerbread houses, think of this. Understand God from the beginning has had a plan, and he has been working that plan eternally, a plan that even now we are a part of. These last words of the Old Testament from God hint at that plan. So for the people that heard this originally, he doesn't put a time on it. He doesn't even say that this is going to happen soon. He just says that a new prophet is coming. And just like that, the Old Testament ends. Now understand, this is one of the very last prophecies that God's people, the Israelites, would hear for a very long time. As the Old Testament ends, the God's people are kind of left in a little bit of limbo. He was all but silent to his people after this prophecy for 400 years or so. This was the last they had heard. There had not been a prophet after this. There had been no new word from God. That means that in the time leading up to what we see in the New Testament, which begins with the story of what we call Christmas, God's people, the Jews, had been in this serious limbo. They had suffered the consequences of their sin by being sent into exile. They had lost their homeland, and then eventually they had been allowed to come back, but under a lot of conditions. So they were still scattered. They were still without this identity. And for a very long time, for generations, they had been without a fresh, affirming word from God. Now, all of that is to say... <clears throat> That by the time we get to the opening of the New Testament, the Israelites as a whole were left in a bit of an identity crisis. And Zechariah in particular stands out as a bit of an outlier. Now, as much as the people would have wanted to believe that God is working his plan, as much as they had had hundreds and hundreds of years of history proving that God does do what his plan says, most recently in their history, they had had from God basically nothing. So it's difficult to hold on to faith that God was still doing something in this time. Sure, they had the Old Testament scriptures, they had the law and the prophets, but they hadn't had any real word, any significant development for generations. So for many, their faith was wearing very, very thin. And then there's Zechariah, a priest serving this broken people. So look with me at Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, it introduces Zechariah to us. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So here's the idea. Zechariah in the priestly line serves in the priesthood, Right? Again, that's, that's going to be something that's difficult to keep people engaged in. When there hasn't been a new word from God, there hasn't been a prophet speaking into this, all they have to turn to is all that God has done in what is becoming more and more the distant past. But he and his wife Elizabeth had been devoted. And as the verse said, they knew the law of God and they had followed it well. They were counted as righteous. And they've been at this for a long time. The verse even calls them old in what is probably the most polite way possible, saying that they were advanced in years. I feel more and more each day that I am becoming advanced in years. <laughs> so I get it. 
Now, the plot thickens in verses 8 to 17. Look with me as it says this. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So after all this time comes a message from God reminding Zechariah that he is in, indeed still working a plan, a plan that many at many times had lost faith in, a plan that really had caused them to doubt that God was still present, that God was still good. That plan has been working all of this time, and now that plan is about to come to fruition. Now, this message comes from the angel Gabriel, who will speak to Mary later on. Gabriel brings the shocking message that reiterates what we just discovered in Malachi. God is working his plan. Now, it may have taken a lot longer than Zechariah and many of his people may have wanted, but it is and always has been happening. God, in his own timing, is working his own good plan. And it says in the verse, Gabriel sends the message that God is sending a new prophet, a new person to speak his truth to his people, a new representative of his unfolding plan. This new messenger will be called John, and he will bring joy and gladness to the barren Elizabeth and her husband, and there will be great rejoicing at his birth. The verse says that he will be set apart, he will be different, and he will turn the hearts of many to the Lord their God. You can even see identical language to what we read from the 400 years before in Malachi, that he will be like Elijah, that he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, that he will lead people back to their God, that he will make God's people prepared. Now, not only all that. But to Zechariah's surprise, not only is God's plan happening, but God's plan is going to happen through him and his wife together. They are the ones that are going to have this miracle child. Now, who can remember another time in the Bible in which a baby was born to people who were too old? Anybody? Abraham, Abraham and Sarah, right? This is a kind of a pattern that we see when major things are happening by God in the Bible. Sometimes he gives a baby to people who have no business having a baby. Now, while this story rarely gets the kind of attention that Abraham and Sarah did, it is equally important. John, who we will eventually know as John the Baptist, is the incredibly important figure tasked with making preparations for God's continually unfolding plan. That is John's job. He is to prepare God's people. So the next thing that I think that we see in this story, not only in this story, but in redemptive history, is that God prepares his people. That's the next blank on your sheet if you're following along with us. God prepares his people. Now remember, this is true in two senses. Very truly in this moment in the life of Zechariah, God is preparing him for the miraculous birth of a son. And in addition to that, John would serve as the one who prepares the way for the Messiah. Right now, in this part of the story, Zechariah is reminded that God is working his plan. His people must be prepared. But in the greater sense, in the larger biblical sense, in the redemptive history sense, we know this to be true as well. God is working. And as he works, God does work in the hearts of individuals. That 400 years of silence that happened between the Old Testament and the New, that was part of God's preparing of his people. 
We see it happen with individuals throughout all of the Bible. When God wants to do something, God speaks to a person and prepares them for the work that he calls them to do. It is part of the pattern that we see of God throughout the Bible. God prepares his people. Even in periods that feel like silence, even in long times where it feels like you're waiting to hear that message from God, even if, when it feels like God is silent, there's a pretty good chance that God is doing something to prepare you for his own working and his own timing for his own purposes. And this preparation becomes quite personal for Zechariah in verses 18 to 23. Look, at me, look with me at it. It says this. It says, And Zechariah said to the angel, <clears throat> How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. <clears throat> and the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. So I think we can understand that in this moment, Zechariah's concerns are pretty valid, right? After all this time, God is now saying that suddenly that there is going to be a new prophet and that prophet is going to be born to him and his wife. That's a hard thing for him to digest. So of course he has doubts. But because of his doubt of an angel speaking to him, he is now struck with something difficult. He is now struck mute. Plus, you, you might imagine that even if he could speak, it would have been difficult to explain to his dear wife, Elizabeth, who is advanced in years, that now suddenly they have to be in the business of childbearing again. That's going to be a tough product to sell, is it not? So we are actually spared that awkward conversation that... Zechariah, in all likelihood, had to write down. He could no longer speak. He had to communicate this in a different way to his wife, somehow, that they were going to have a child in their old age. So the fact that he's not able to sp speak anymore, the fact that he is now mute, shows us, I think, one other thing that we can believe to be true based on this story, but also in redemptive history, and that is this. God's preparation can often be uncomfortable. That's the next blank on your sheet if you're following along. God's preparation can often be uncomfortable. Not only would it be difficult for Zechariah to convince his wife that she would have a baby at her age, not only would it be difficult for them to raise that baby, not only was it an extreme amount of pressure knowing that this child was meant to prepare the way for the Messiah, but now part of the preparation for Zechariah personally is that he will spend at least nine months or more unable to speak. But in that, we see also what we've said before. Zechariah's uncomfortable period of preparation is reflective of what God's people had experienced all along. God had waited 400 years for this turning point. That preparation was incredibly uncomfortable for his people and even painful at times. But it is part of the redemptive plan of God throughout history in all of eternity. The idea that I hope you see here is that in times of preparation, even when it's uncomfortable or if you are left waiting, God is still working his plan. Throughout all of the discomfort, God was making his people prepared and he prepares us still for his continually unfolding plan. And as we see in the story, God's plan does go forward. Look with me at verses 24 to 25. It says this. <clears throat> After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among my people. Elizabeth does conceive. The uncomfortable shame of having been barren all of her life has prepared her heart for the exceeding joy of this new miracle in her. Yes, the preparation was painful. Yes, it was uncomfortable. But God was doing something, and that plan is fulfilled. That's what I want you to see that is true in this story right now, but also true in redemptive history. We can know as believers and fully understand based on the Bible and based on our own lives 
that God's plans and purposes are fulfilled. God's purposes are fulfilled. That's the next blank on your sheet. We see this to be true in the story and throughout all of redemptive history. God had spoken the promise through Malachi hundreds of years before, and now on this day for Zechariah and Elizabeth, it has come to pass. God promised this to Zechariah through the angel, and he has done exactly what he said he would do. Now, if you skip down a little bit, if you're looking at your physical Bible, we're not going to read it verse by verse just because we don't have the time to cover every bit of it today. But as the story goes on in verses 57 to 66, we see his plan continue to unfold in their lives. That miracle of, of John's birth <clears throat> receives a lot of attention from the people. John is born to Elizabeth, and the people do celebrate it. Now, traditionally, after his birth, on the day of his circumcision, John would be named, right? But Zechariah, at this point, still can't speak. So as this child, John, is presented to his community, the people ask, what will you call him? And Elizabeth says that we'll call him John. Now, that's unusual because it would normally be Zechariah that would have that opportunity. And it's also unusual because the child normally would have been named a family name. But that is not the case. This is a miracle baby with a name that was commanded by God to be given to him. He does not receive the family name, and he doesn't receive it from his father. Elizabeth announces that his name is John. <clears throat> the community is really surprised by this, and at that moment, Zechariah's mouth is finally opened. He can, as the angel told him, as these things are fulfilled, he can now speak again. <clears throat> and again, as he speaks... Their friends and neighbors are amazed at this work of God, and word begins to spread, and there is now, at least on a very small scale, new anticipation for God's unfolding plan. <clears throat> and the best part is that this interesting chapter is really just the intro to the even more miraculous and more important story of the birth of Jesus. But now that his mouth is finally open, Zechariah the priest has a message that has been brewing inside of him for months. And finally, this morning, we get to this morning's song from the original Christmas soundtrack. Now keep in mind, we don't have a lot of reason to believe that Zechariah sung this. He probably stated it publicly and someone wrote it down. It was made memorable for a lot of reasons. But either way, it was adopted as what's called a canticle in the early church and was sung for a very long time. And this is our original Christmas soundtrack song today. This is what Zechariah says in Luke chapter 1, verses 67 to 69. Now, as we read it, <clears throat> listen carefully with the points that we've just covered in mind. That God has been working his eternal plan forever. That God prepares his people, that God's preparation is sometimes uncomfortable, but ultimately that God's purposes are fulfilled. Now keep that in mind, and as we read it, I really encourage you, since it's printed on your sheets, circle any major words that stand out to you that really exemplify God's purposes and plans throughout all of history. <clears throat> Listen closely to this original Christmas song. It says, And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying... Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy, promise to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. This is Zechariah's song of praise surrounding the birth of his son John, who would prepare the way for Jesus. Now I know that it doesn't feel 
exactly Christmassy on the surface, but this is the most Christmassy you can get. God had been preparing his people for a long time for this ultimate big act that he would do through Jesus Christ. So even leading up to the birth of Jesus, which is miraculous in its own unique ways, there was another miraculous birth, and it was the birth of John that should never have happened, but only happened because God had a plan. He prepared his people, and God's purposes were fulfilled. So of course, in the light of that, Zechariah offers this song of praise to God and this prophecy for who his new son would be based on God, what God had told him. And to summarize the song, Zechariah says that God has come to us, and he says that he is redeemed. That means that God seeks to restore, to fix what was broken, to, not, to mend the gap, to close the distance. God is bringing salvation to his people, as was planned and foretold throughout their Jewish history. It says God will show mercy. He will remember his covenant with Abraham. And we've talked about this before, but the covenant with Abraham, just to refresh your memory, was that all peoples of the earth, all nations, would be blessed through the man, Abraham, through his bloodline. Jesus was of that bloodline, and all nations are indeed blessed through him. Now, Zechariah prophesies that his son, this baby that was just born to him, will be a prophet, preparing the way, giving knowledge of salvation to his people. John would indeed preach repentance from sin, leading people to the mercy that, is, that it is embodied by Jesus. This message of repentance and the coming Savior would give light to those who sit in darkness and guide their feet in the way of peace. That is Zechariah's amazing song. Now this amazing tribute to what God is doing and has done should stick in our minds this Christmas season. And in it, we see one last part of Zechariah's personal story that I think also connects to our idea of redemptive history. As God's purposes are fulfilled, and we see it all the time, the last blank on your sheet is this. God receives praise. God receives praise. That's what Zechariah's song is all about. It's a pretty amazing song, and it's an integral part of the Christmas story. The way had to be prepared for the coming Jesus. And Zechariah's story rightly ends with Zechariah giving him praise, giving praise to the God who is and has been orchestrating this amazing story of salvation for all of history. But this act of praise also ref reflects the end that we know to be true. All of the Old Testament was preparing the way for this coming Jesus. We get to see and know this Jesus, to know who he is, to know what he has done, to know that he has sought to know us and to save us. Jesus came as the culmination of God's purposes and plan, and that Jesus will reign victorious over all things. And as we bring up fairly often, we should remember and understand God's ultimate purpose and plan is for his own glory for him to be glorified, for him to be praised. And we can know from what the Bible tells us and from what we experience even now knowing him, that as his purposes are fulfilled, God will receive praise. He will receive the glory and honor that is due to him. But reflecting on the story and the song leading up to Christmas and even reflecting on these truths about what God is doing and has done, it should stir something personal in us as well. These major concepts that we see in the story apply to each of us now. So right now, today, in a very uncomfortable time in our lifetimes, we can take comfort in the knowledge and the reminder that we see in the Bible today that God has an eternal plan. It's been playing out through all of history. Sometimes it's really difficult for us, especially as Christians that have a hard time with what's going on in the world. It's hard for us to see the forest for the trees, right? It's hard for us to understand that there's something bigger going on when all of these problems are right in our faces. And this morning, I, I hope and pray that through this story, through Zechariah's song, you can be reminded that we have a God who is absolutely in control, who has a purpose and a plan, not only for your brief life here, but for all of eternity. That plan will be fulfilled. God will not fail. 
No matter how out of control we may feel today, God is not out of control. Everything can and will play out according to his good and perfect will and his eternal sovereign plan. We can take comfort in that today. Secondly, I think that we can know that God is still in the business of preparing people to engage in his plan. Now, at times that preparation may feel uncomfortable or even painful. But our eternal God does have a plan, and we would do well to realize that our light and momentary afflictions are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, which is what it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. You may be hurting right now. You may feel distant from God, but you can approach that to say that God is not there. God is not doing anything, but I would say that you are absolutely wrong. I think the better approach to say when you are suffering, when you are hurting, when you are uncomfortable, when it feels like God has been silent for a long time, is to see and understand that maybe God is preparing you to engage in the plan that is absolutely happening. Maybe the, the painful parts are parts of your life that are preparing you for what is coming next. God still prepares his people, even if that preparation is sometimes difficult. Now, thirdly, I believe that we see in the story leading up to Christmas, as we are reminded of God's incredible plan to redeem and rescue, we see in this story a picture of the gospel. We do not earn our salvation on our own. God sends the Redeemer. And if you've never turned to Jesus in repentance and faith, if, you've, if you're watching this online with us and, and you've never taken the step to say, I repent of my sins and I want to follow this Jesus, this Jesus that was foretold by John, this Jesus who is the culmination of redemptive history, who God has planned from the very beginning, I encourage you to do that today. Wait no longer. All that you have been through up to now could very well be God's preparation for this moment. Turn to Jesus. Receive salvation and do what is right and praise his name. Because the end result of Jesus saving people is that God receives the praise and the glory and the honor that is due to his name. So this morning we praise God <clears throat> for the salvation that we have in Christ. A salvation that has been planned from the beginning by God. A salvation that was foretold throughout the Old Testament. That was teased by Malachi. That was revealed to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And heralded by their miraculous prophet son John. And hopefully received by you. God planned your salvation. He prepared you for it. That preparation may have been uncomfortable or even painful, but his purpose is fulfilled as people like you and me turn to him in repentance and faith and give him the praise that he deserves. Amen. Let's pray together. God, you are deserving of all the glory and the honor and the praise. In this story this morning, help us to see the bigger picture. In a, in a season and in a time that demands all of our attention moment to moment be drawn to problems and things that we have to fix or things that we have to do. God, instead, I pray that you will give us peace, prepare our hearts moment to moment to see and understand that you are working a good plan over time. God, most of all, I, I thank you and I praise you for the miracle of the birth of John because he prepared the way for what we now know to be the greatest of salvations, a salvation not based in what we can do, but a salvation that is fully initiated and completed by you and your goodness and mercy and grace. Thank you for Jesus, who John proclaimed for his whole life. Help us to proclaim and praise him this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing one more song together. This one will actually be a Christmas song. It's called, Let Us Adore. Thank <clears throat> you.